So welcome all to New Perspectives, which is being hosted by La Grasse Shirobindo Life Center here in Fountain Inn, South Carolina. I'm Rade, and I'm being joined by uh, Vladimir Yatsenko and uh, also by our two uh, guest speakers, Anarada and Jayanti. Um, welcome all attendees, welcome uh, guest speakers. Before we begin, let us open with a moment of concentration and evoke the presence of Sri Aurobindo and the mother. Thank you. So today is part seven of our eight part series on the coming of the subjective age. And many of you have been with us throughout this series while um, others have only been able to join for one or two webinars. So if you missed any of the previous webinars in this series or are interested in rewatching certain webinars, um, they are now available on LaGrasse's newly launched Knowledge Bank, along with over 250 other webinars, films, meditations, audiobooks, and articles. So I'd like to just take a moment before we begin and just show you how you can access this uh, database and uh, do a screen share here of our website. For those who have not been on our website before, the uh, URL is just thelagrassecenter.com. I'm assuming you can see my uh, screen at this uh, point, Vladimir. Okay, perfect. So once you get onto our website, you will see some tabs up here. And if you go to online learning, there's three options. We have live stream uh, events such as today's and all of our study groups that you can click on and find out what events are coming up. We have our courses and workshops, which include self-paced programs that you can click on and go in and see what courses are, are upcoming. And then, of course, our newly launched uh, Knowledge Bank, which will require the first time that you click on this for you to just register and create an account. But after that, all these uh, webinars and uh, audiobooks, et cetera, are uh, free for, for your uh, use. And we set up several uh, uh, search engines. You can just search on uh, a keyword. Let's say we want to do subjective age and you're interested in these uh, previous ses sessions and up will come part one, two, three, four, five, six. And you just click on any of them and you'll have the video. Um, you can uh, alternatively pick from a number of topics or type if you're interested in our, audio, our articles or research or uh, films or webinars, programs, or any of our presenters here. We have had over the last two or three years, I don't know, maybe 50 or, or 60 different presenters. So you can pick on any one of them and uh, find the webinar you're looking for. So just wanted to take that moment for you that uh, haven't had a chance maybe to uh, watch the previous series and or would like to access our knowledge bank. So with that, um, at this time, let me uh, do a formal introduction of our uh, two honorable guest speakers who will address today the topic of integral education and the paradigm shift towards spiritual education in the subjective age. And our first speaker today will be Anuradha Agwal, who is co-founder of the Gnostic Center and a teacher and teacher educator by training. She has been engaged in the field of integral education since 1986 through teaching, research, and curriculum design. Anuradha facilitates courses in integral education and self-development for educators and parents, homemakers, and professionals. In Anuradha's view, and given the current world scenario, she says the most important aspects to cultivate at this time are an interconnection with one's deepest self, a widening of the mind, and a refinement of the aesthetic sense. So once again, welcome, Anuradha. It's uh, wonderful that you can join us here today. We're very honored. And our second speaker will be Dr. Jayanti Ramachandra, who is the principal of Mirampika Free Progress School in Delhi. 
She plays an active role in the Sri Aurobindo Ashram Dali Branch in organizing and facilitating activities for use of the ashram, as well as aspirants from other Sri Aurobindo centers in India. Jayanti is also on the organizing team of Oneness, where youths from all over India attend camps centered around integral philosophy. She is vice chairperson of the Sri Aurobindo Society Sing Singapore and holds a PhD in education from the King's College London. Welcome, Jayanti. So once again today, Anuradha and then Jayanti will share their vision of integral education in the subjective age, after which, as always, there will be time for questions and comments. So if you'd like to join the panel and ask your question uh, directly to Anuradha and Jayanti, just raise your hand at any time during uh, their talk. And towards the end, we'll bring you over uh, to, to join us on the panel. And alternatively, you can just post your questions in the Q&A box. So once again, welcome all. And I'd like to just turn it over to you at this time, Anuradha. Thanks a lot, Ravi. What I'll be sharing today is based on Sri Aurobindo's chapters on the subjective age in his book, The Human Cycle. And I was fortunate to study it with Dev Deep, whom I must thank for whatever little understanding I've gained of it. I plan to focus uh, today on what is the subjective age and are we there yet? What are the subjective trends in education and how do we prepare ourselves to manifest the subjective age? We are in a unique position today because uh, it's a phase of transition. We are transiting from a rationalistic, individualistic age to a subjective with even hints of the spiritual already present. And also as self-conscious reflective beings, we can step back and look at all this and evaluate what we experience in ourselves. On the one hand, there is the mind which is full of noise, which insists on finding solutions through the reason. And on the other, there is something deeper in us which is not satisfied with those solutions, which doesn't find that they lead us to any certitude or it's simply a great waste of time before we find the right answer. The world we live in is also far from perfect. Something in us yearns for harmony, nobility, beauty, perfection. We want a world free of divisions and conflict, of strife, the ugliness of human consciousness, a world that manifests the quiet beauty and grace, which we might experience at times simply when we are in nature or with music, ourselves, meditation, a book, painting, whatever, various means. At such moments, when we are kind of at one with ourselves, we may feel a spontaneity that knows what is the right thing to be done. There is a lightness of being and there is an unconditional joy, love and beauty, not caused by anything outer, but just something which wells from within. These moments might be brief or fleeting, but these are the intimations of the soul and one has to catch them and strengthen them. This is the push of the subjective age. And this is the opportunity it offers us. Just as the early human being would have felt that the flashes of reason for centuries before it became a norm when life could be guided by reason. Similarly, these inner flashes we experience and they are on their way to becoming a norm, even if it takes a few decades or a century. Now, subjective age, uh, as I know it's a mixed audience, I will just briefly go over it, that it follows the age of individualism. Individualism is the age when the mind, uh, the human being is no longer willing to submit blindly to conventions and rituals and norms and starts questioning. And that questioning happens through the mind, through the use of reason. So there is a an emphasis on being an individual, on finding one's own way, but it is all driven by the mind, by the reason. And then there comes a point 
which we are witnessing, when reason is no longer sufficient, when everything has been tried out, whether in governance and economic systems to save the environment, uh, religions, you know, various things have been tried out. And somehow we are not reaching the harmony that we are yearning for. We are not reaching the answers that we are looking for. There is no certitude. All the best isms and systems, democracy, capitalism, communism, everything breaks down. So then what is it that answers? And that is where the seeking begins but to go beyond the mind, to look for a deeper, a higher consciousness. Now, this is what subjectivism is. There is a search for something deeper, a turning inwards. What we see is that there is a one central core that creates the problems. And that core, that disease, is the ego. Now, ego is a big word, but we experience it. Basically, it's the principle of divisiveness. It's the principle of self-interest, uh, to put it simply. My good, my gain at the cost of anything else. Ideologically, we might say we have moved beyond it, at least some people. But even, when, even with the best of people, when the self-interest is really at stake, we see that one slips back into first one's self-interest and then anything else. So what is required is a consciousness that is incapable of ego, incapable of ego, incapable of division and strife. It's like a chemical change. It is something which is, cannot be reverted back again. It is a different consciousness. Now, various spiritual and religious traditions have pointed us towards it, that such a consciousness does exist in each one of us. In the integral yoga, Sri Aurobindo and Mother have called it the psychic being, the Chaitya Purush. The psychic is like a light shining deep in the center of our being. We might come in touch with it in quiet moments. We might experience, experience it as a silence, as a stillness, as a warmth, as a quiet smile, as a light, various experiences. The power of the psychic is that it is in touch with the true purpose of our life and it is capable of manifesting it. But what happens is that the outer consciousness, the mind, the body, the physical consciousness and the emotional vital, they kind of cast a veil around it and it becomes difficult to reach the psychic or listen to the psychic. Why it has happened is another story which we will not go into, but there is a purpose to that also. So the whole evolution is driving us towards turning to the psychic and it's like the stage is set and now the main hero or heroine has to come forth and that is the psychic. Now education makes no attempt to nurture this, to call it forth. There is hardly any understanding of it. Uh, there might be lip service to soul uh, because we've heard it in religion but it is not a real entity for us. Like we can say, okay, mind will do this to my life and my life will become like this. I'll be able to organize it through the power of the mind. We are not able to say, what will we do with the soul? What is this power? Can it, is it really dynamic? Or will it take us, take us away from life and make us into meditating beings with no connection to the real world? The mother and Shurabindu point us to something else because... Uh, it is true that in many yogic traditions, the trend has been to take us away from life. But integral yoga, one speciality is that it asks us to master life through the power of the spirit. And the instrument for that is the psychic being. That's the first instrument. So they give a lot of importance that if you realize the psychic, if you come in touch with it and bring it forth, then you know why you are born, what you have to do in this life, and you can take spontaneous decisions which are in harmony with your purpose, with your goal, with your aim. So you kind of become a master of your destiny rather than being a victim of circumstances. Now, that's a huge shift. It might sound like something existential, but even in simple things, you know, to prepare for this talk, I spent two, three days just my mind was going on and so many versions I rejected. And I think, my God, if I was stationed in the psychic, 
you know, it would be like this, one minute and the work is done. So the mind takes a lot of time. It is just like the previous consciousness is less developed, would labor at something, the mind is able to do it faster. Same with the psychic consciousness is much more powerful and can do things faster. And to some extent, all of us have experienced it. We might not be calling it that, but we have experienced times when everything seems to fall in place. Everything seems to just work magically. Answers come and we are able to uh, be pretty wise. The good thing is that the time spirit is with us. The thrust of the subjective age is seeking this. There is an aspiration which we can see even on the billboards, the advertisements, towards self-consciousness and self-realization. There is an attempt to cultivate a greater self-awareness and intuition. Even science is moving towards that with the quantum leaps and all. There is a kind of a merging of you know, consciousness, the subtler realities playing a role in even on matter. So it seems like the stage is really set for this to happen. Now in education, something of this shift began in the early 20th century. That is what Sri tells us. Education is such as uh, Montessori, Dewey, Steiner, Rabindranath Tagore, and then of course, Sri and the mother. Instead of looking at the child as an empty vessel to be stuffed with information, the shift came that, okay, there is a being here, there is a soul here, there is something conscious here, which needs to be nurtured and which needs to be consulted even, and the capacities need to be developed rather than just stuffing. The capacity is okay, moved from intellectual to moral, in some cases physical. There were still gaps, gaps which we became aware, especially I can say for myself, when I was introduced to integral education, because the paradigm that integral education takes up is uh, clearly separating the mind and the vital being. Generally, it is always clubbed together. And then also talking very in very clear terms about the agency of the psychic. Now, these aspects are missing from education. There might be moral education, but it is not, or there might be even training of behavior to some extent character, but it is not really dealing with the psychic or with the vital even. So the question is, what are the roadblocks? Why is not happening? In my view, one, there is very little understanding of what the soul is, like I already said, or the psychic or the inner being. And then what happens, the idea of freedom is there, but then freedom is given to any, any voice in our being. And that creates its own problem. And then we say, look, it doesn't work. Children become indisciplined. Freedom is not the answer. And yet the character of the psychic is freedom. It's like a little flower which grows in freedom. And the only thing it needs is nurturing and the right conditions. So this understanding has to develop. What is this inner being? What is the soul? What is the psychic? And what is the freedom that we are talking about? The second problem I feel is that the complexity of the human being is not understood. How the different parts in us pull in different directions and how they tend to dominate each other and how can they be harmonized? And again, what is the agency which will harmonize that? The mind doesn't have that power. What we think one moment, we change it. The emotions do not want to listen to the mind. So we experience this every day. I don't need to go further into it, but this is our experience, normal experience. We say things we didn't mean to. So who's in control? Is there anybody in control? And that control being really established, not a fickle shifting control. And the third problem is, even when education is child-centered, there have been many experiments which have been done over the decades, over a century, uh, very beautiful experiments even, where children are being taken into consideration and a lot of uh, interesting things are being done in education, self-directed learning concept has come in, evaluation is being tried out in different ways. So even when that happens, ultimately at the end of the day, most often, the aim remains the same, to somehow, through more friendly means, prepare the child to fit into the world, prepare the child for a lucrative career and success and fitting into the social norms. 
So the aims of education have not changed to that extent to impact everything dynamically. Now, speaking of the psychic, the mother writes, and I want to quote her here, in most cases, the presence, the psychic presence that is, this acts from behind the veil and it is unrecognized and unknown. But in some people, it is perceptible and its action recognizable. And even in a very few, the presence becomes tangible and its action fully effective. Just like we can see the mind in each other that now she's speaking from the mind. Now this is how the mind is operating. Saying, similarly, the mother says in a few people that presence is obvious enough, has come forth and it can be perceived. You might perceive it as something which suddenly when you are in their presence, you feel at peace yourself, or you feel some kind of power or beauty emanating from their being, or a delight, a lightness of being. These people, they go forward in life with an assurance and a certitude all their own. They are masters of their destiny. And it is for this purpose that psychic education is important. So if we want to prepare ourselves for this, for we want to prepare the children for a life of true mastery and certitude, deep wisdom and integrity, we need to call forth the psychic into action so that it can start guiding the mind, the emotions and the physical. It is not that the outer being will become irrelevant because without that we cannot act. So that has to be trained as well. And that is what integral education is about. But this integration is not like a jigsaw puzzle integrated. It is integral. It is held at the core. The center is the psychic, just like a flower is held centrally at its core. And the interesting thing is because it's a consciousness beyond the mind, although now we are speaking with the agency of the mind, but the mind cannot fully know it. One has to experience it. Like uh, I think Sri Ramakrishna has said that, how can you describe the taste of a rasgulla? You have to eat it. You know, you have to eat the sweet. You have to experience, and you can still never describe that. So the experience has to be gained. Only when then we can know how it acts in us, and then we can spark off something in the others and find ways how to express it in education. The mother, of course, has given certain indications in her chapter on psychic education, which those of you who are interested can read. Now, if you have to, the second thing is that if you have to direct education at a collective level towards the subjective aims and then the spiritual aims, which is to bring the spirit, the psychic, and then the higher agency of the spirit forth, then the society also has to believe in it. It has to believe in the same. Yeah, it's worth achieving. Let's give it a try. It might begin with a small, uh, small number of people. Most change does. That's how revolutions happen. It is always a minority uh, which starts that. And then the idea, the ripples spread. And till it takes time, till uh, maybe decades, maybe centuries before it is, gets accepted by most people. Even today, we cannot say everybody is living from the mental consciousness, but mental consciousness is dominating for sure. So we have to have faith in it and engage with it. And then only aims of education can change. So we have to also know, inform ourselves that how will it impact the day-to-day -day life? How will it make us have a greater mastery rather than cutting us away from life because that somewhere is at the core of negating it you know oh spirituality is for when we grow old when you know, this is something for later and yet that is what Sri and mother tell us that this is something which has to be there right from the beginning not as a life negating thing but as a life affirming and a life mastering force so this is what education needs to engage with integral education has been away, but again there, the crux comes back to the teacher, the educators, the administrators, to the extent we practice this for ourselves, because this is 
uh, this is not that there is a code that do this, do this, and then this will happen. Everybody has to engage in it and experience it and then the change. So there's a lot of freedom, but with freedom as always comes responsibility, comes the challenge to innovate, to be original, to engage with it. And that is why perhaps no matter how much we desire freedom, there is a fear of freedom also. And that is why I think uh, integral education has not really converted into a mass movement because it is not a structured formula given thing. Formulas are for mind. The psychic is not something which works through formula. So when you go beyond the mind, you have to give up. Uh, somebody told me, I got a message today that today, I don't know Vladimir if you knew it, but today is the anniversary of, it's called Gita Jayanti, the day when Sri Krishna gave the, uh, the whole sermon of the Gita to Arjun. And honestly, when one thinks of psychic, that is one of the supreme examples where the, the most dynamic of actions is being done, but through the power of the psychic, through that still center, which is held within, through that faith that it is something for a higher cause, and then action dedicated to the divine is being done from that stillness. So that is something we have to move towards. Shrabindu points out two things in this practice. If we engage in the inner work with ourselves, because that is always the starting point, he says, remember two things. One, that the ego is not the self. There is one self of all, and our soul is a portion of that universal divinity. Now, these sound very hi-fi words, but basically what he's saying is that it is when we connect with the inner self, the soul, the soul is a portion of the divine, and there we are connected with the deepest truth. So when the freedom is there, even though I act individually, because I'm acting from that connection with the universal, my action cannot harm somebody else. Now harm also is no, does not mean Arjun went and killed people. So it's not that kind of harm, but it's harm at a deeper level, the progress of the soul, why anybody has come upon earth, one person or the other person. Now, this is a, I mean, we need time to engage with this, which is not there, but I'm just presenting that this concept that the ego is not the self because ego is always a tool for division, for demarcation, for self-interest. So as long as we remain caught in that, it, it, it cannot, we cannot move towards the psyche. And the second thing he says is that I am not only myself, but I exist in solidarity with all my kind. So there is a universal aspect also to my being. I cannot exist in isolation. So immediately you see that it is not something he's saying, now you go into a cave and meditate and you will have nothing to do with the others. It is a collective yoga which has to be done. It is both individual and collective. And finally, I would like to touch upon what would education look like in the subjective age? Shrabindu has given some pointers in his chapter on the conditions, the coming of the spiritual age. The guiding aim, this will be different. This will be the revealing and finding the divine self in each human being. Now, this was already to some extent done in Vedic India. When we see the art and craft and sculpture of that time, the sciences of that time, it's never the person who's in front. It is the knowledge and the dedication to a higher purpose that is in front. And that is why it has lasted so long. That is what the rishis were insisting on, this connection with the inner self, not on uh, worldly success and fame and signing your name on everything. That was not the aim. The aim was perfection and self-realization. And when you create something with that perfection, then it has its own repercussions. If your field is such where you will get fame, fame you will get. If you're king's son, you will be famous. But that was not the purpose. The second is the teaching and learning methods. They also have to change because they have to tap into inner, deeper and higher powers. Integral education, uh, the way it is practiced today 
is still not there. I have interacted with a lot of integral schools. We have a school of our own also. I've worked in Mirambika, been to the ashram school also. That aspiration is there. One teacher or somebody may be trying, but again, it comes back to to what extent am I living it? Have I engaged with it? To that extent, I can spark it off and work with it with the students also. There, both the students and the teachers, even in the integral paradigm, still have a long way to go, I would say. Powers of self-awareness, which are easier, intuition, more difficult, silent receptivity, inspiration, learning through identity, such things. Now, it doesn't mean that the mind will not be used, but the mind will be an instrument because unless the reason is trained, observation is trained, all the mental faculties are trained, they cannot express the inspiration that comes from above. The greatest scientists, the greatest musicians, they have acted on inspiration. They have not created through the mind. The, the seed of that great idea is a revelation or an inspiration. But because their outer being was trained, their hands were trained to play the piano or whatever, they could translate that inspiration into something magnificent. So this is the balance that is needed. The curriculum also would be organized around this central aim. So each subject would become a means for discovering the inner truth of what that subject is meant for. So art to express the divine beauty in matter, similarly science to discover consciousness behind matter, which I, like I said, is already starting to happen. Sociology to look at human beings as portions of the divine rather than uh, something with, which, which is always full of darkness or you know, the whole perspective of law would change, of ethics would change if these things came about. Sri has spoken so beautiful about it. If any of you are interested, please refer to this chapter in the human cycle. And economics, he says, that its aim will be letting each and everyone experience the joy of working as per their nature. The joy of working as per their nature and have free leisure to grow inwardly. Now we see in uh, developed countries, in materially prosperous countries, the working hours have become very less and people can engage in uh, you know, spending their leisure time on themselves. Of course, what they do with it may not be finding their real self or true self, but some people would do that. Whatever it is, this shift is happening already. But it is still a luxury for most of us to be engaged in a work that is true to our nature. And that is what Sri Aurobindo is asking for. And he's visualizing that through the subjective age, moving towards the spiritual age, this is the shift which will come about in economics. And similarly in politics, each nation as a soul with its own nature. So we have to reflect in the light of this on questions about what it would mean if you are a teacher engaged in education, in integral education, what it would mean for your pedagogy, what it would mean for your curriculum, for your learning environment, for your evaluation systems. And are you ready to take this, make this shift first of all for yourself? What would it mean for teacher education, for example? So these are very interesting questions, but again, the answers do not have to come from the mind. They have to come from the inner being. And in the end, I will quote one sentence from Sri Aurobindo, maybe a couple, which, very simply tell us that actually we don't have to do much because he says, if we ever give the psychic a chance to come forward and still more, if we call it into the foreground as the leader of the march set in our front, this itself will take up most of the business of education out of our hands. So instead of mentally planning, okay, how will I design this subjective age education, spiritual age education, once the psychic comes forth, it will reveal itself, what it has to be. So that is the shift that is needed. Thank you. Thank you, Anuradha, very much, um, especially for that, that last uh, message that this shift into uh, the subjective age really begins with each of us. And uh, it's not something that we can 
plan out or that we can think through our uh, think through as far as solutions and how to make this transition uh, smoothly. So uh, appreciate that very strong message at the end. And uh, I think at this time we do have at least one question, but but uh, please make sure attendees if you have questions to to add in the Q and A, and then we'll take them. Um, in a few uh, minutes here after uh, Jayanti has had a chance to share her thoughts uh, on integral education in the coming subjective age. Jayanti? Okay. And you'll just have to unmute yourself, of course. Yes, thank you, Radhe. And uh, thank you, Anuradha, for laying the ground so comprehensively. Um, you have covered all of all of the thought on subjectivism and also you leaped into the spiritual age. Um, I will just uh, a little bit, I will share, I'll take a few minutes um, about uh, integral education, which you rightly said was a work in progress, that um, um, aspiration is there by the people involved in this kind of a setup um, to move forward and realize something greater within themselves and to actualize it. Um, this uh, integral education that uh, we practice has been offered by the Mother and Sri Aurobindo uh, with a spiritual foundation for the spiritual age. So, um, uh, so that itself keeps the whole uh, practice of it um, alive. It gives it another kind of life compared with the uh, maybe another model of education. And um, in, in our kind of setup, for example, in Mirambika, what is happening here is that um, attention is given to how one could re reach within, how one could reach that core within and help that or get that to express itself and then take over life. For example, practices in concentration happens and um, uh, we have uh, self-observation. Of course, uh, faculty development happens through various activities, which the, the teachers, the diyas, they are called facilitators or diyas, they try out. And uh, we have uh, reflective practices, which, you know, it, it, it differs. It all is dependent on the, the, the strength of the aspiration of each individual. So the readings are done. The practice is taken up in the classrooms and then the reflective practice also happens to ask oneself tough questions with the with the help of you know questions that uh, someone else may devise or somebody experienced in this uh, may devise and in the process of self reflection one discovers where one has posited oneself from which plane one is looking into it am i hovering on the surface or have i gone deeper in and how deep so all these this, this, this kind of things are, are the work in progress, as I mentioned. And um, uh, the, the idea of faculty development and all, it takes place in various forms, but still that is their faculty development, development of the senses is there. And we do a, a character development with the senses. And uh, uh, this uh, idea of creating an environment so what is this creation of an environment all about? It is to allow the children who come into the uh, that environment to open to something called, we can call it beauty, uh, a subtle, um, a subtle um, environment which uplifts the being. So they walk into that. And nothing is said about it, but they experience it um, very subtly. Nobody mentions. And they carry it with them so that at one point they are making choices when they are out of that bubble for example then they would be able to uh, compare that experience with a current experience which doesn't sort of sync with that one and then choices are being made so this kind of uh, um, uh, activities are there only because of the weight of the philosophy only because uh, Sri Aurobindo and the mother had uplifted it with with that you know that vision of the future that vision of the future is going to be this spiritual age which is going to be illumined with the supramental the, the golden light of the supramental and that itself keeps us going um don't know when it will be complete and when we will all enter into this the spiritual age 
But yes, these, these little bubbles, these integral schools which are existing, this is what is happening. And as how you pointed out, Anuradha, the intensity is not there perhaps, or maybe it is with one or two individuals, but it's not widespread. And therefore the entire organization uh, does not rise like this, but then again, it has its own, um, there is a purpose in everything that happens. Maybe there is a plan behind and, and some invisible hand is working this out. But these points which are practicing um, this kind of an education, it is hoped that the light would, it's a flicker maybe now, but it would glimmer and then become brighter and all the points of light should be joining when we don't know, but perhaps that's when uh, we have the advent of the spiritual age um, where the supramental takes over. But meanwhile, yes, it is up to all of us to want it. And then there are so many challenges uh, that we face and in a school set up, the ideology may be there, the philosophy may be there and it would be such a, it is a, it's such a beautiful philosophy to live through, to, to be able to actualize it. But then the challenges come, of course, this is all fraught with challenges which have to be overcome, which, which means a deepening of the being, a widening of the being, the entire being. So we have parents who are coming from different walks of life, different ideas about what the future should be. But yes, I've heard about this particular school. So let me, the, everybody is loving and the child will be taken care of and the child comes in and, and after a while they are floundering also. So then there is a need to embrace that community which is coming in. So that attempt is also being made. How much we can reach out to them, then it, develop, it, it depends on the aspiring, uh, the, the so-called facilitator who is holding the space. And therefore, there is a need to develop the space such that all who come into that ambit, or it's not the ambit, it's the environment, will benefit from it. So the more uh, seriously, not seriously, the more intensely this yoga could be taken up by those who are practicing integral philosophy. And uh, with that, I think uh, that's about it that I wanted to share. Anuradha has uh, uh, brought it out very beautifully in many ways. So this uh, the mother has given a, a student's prayer to all the children. And in that, we see that this transition is there, this future is there, and the past is also there, which has to be gotten rid of. Make of us the hero warriors we aspire to become. May we fight successfully the great battle of the future that is to be born against the past that seeks to endure so that the new things may manifest and we be ready to receive them. Thank you. Thank you, Jayanti. It was wonderful, uh, so beautiful to hear you both, you know, and uh, thank you for this. You're, you're a little soft, uh, Vladimir. I don't know right, if you can speak um, a little louder. will be a little louder. There we go. <clears throat> So um, enjoyed thoroughly your presentations and um, uh, Anuradha's uh, very thorough going deep into all the matters, very beautiful uh, distinctions between um, mental, vital and psychic. This awareness is lacking in the new forms of education. We are not dealing with the planes of consciousness and being, but from integral yoga, we bring it into integral education, become aware how they function. And um, and of course, challenges will be there. Um, I like the idea of environment and its role. And environment cannot be only outer, but also inner. It has to be created this inner psychological culture where people kind of dive and, you know, swim like in a new water or something. We had uh, in Auroville Mi Miramukhi school. It's quite interesting. Mirambika and Miramukhi. <laughs> and they created this environment which was not only outwardly beautiful, but inwardly children, they behaved differently, you know. They spoke, they were not shouting or running or something. There was always kind of um, awareness of of 
not disturbing the beauty of uh, relations. There was a spiritual presence. I remember that. My daughter was in Miramuki, and when they closed, she was devastated. She said, where should I go now? <laughs> there, there was the whole part of her life was taken away from her. This is the role of the environment because it does not impose itself. It just gives you other opportunities to open for the inner being. And um, some more thing I wanted to mention then uh, that uh, teachers are to be yogis, says the mother, yes? because uh, we teach mainly by example. If teachers are not following that, live their life, ordinary life, and then come and preach, children will understand immediately that it is not working. And about the hero's message, it's a Vedic message because Nara, Nri in the Veda, heroic souls of man, we are here to fight the battle with the darkness and to bring more and more spirit into manifestation. So thank you for this beautiful um, treat or feast of integral education in this uh, subjective age. I th think that subjective age is a transition to the spiritual age. And so if you have certain questions or, or to each other, it would be lovely if you could um, generate this discussion. Otherwise, there are more questions here waiting for you. I think you are totally tuned to each other, so you don't need to ask any, <laughs> any question to each other <laughs> because you understand totally your uh, your views. And you're both from Mirambika, it's quite amazing. Uh, it's actually the only school of uh, free progress school in the world, which I know did something substantial and, um, and uh, generated such beautiful educationists as yourself. Uh, so it's a pleasure to have um, kind of a meeting with you. So there are questions here. Uh, thank you for integral education, uh, introducing the aspects of integral education, while the focus on integral education has been made on the child. How relevant and important is it for adult education? Uh, I think Anuradha has uh, something to say about this because she does all the forums and uh, yeah. please Anuradha. Yeah, so like I said, uh, integral education cannot be practiced, cannot be practiced for children unless the teacher, the adult, practices it for oneself. And if you read the mother's chapters also, they were written for teachers, and especially when you read the chapter on psychic education, you can make out that she's addressing the teachers. That is to be practiced by the teachers. Th there the tone completely changes. and. Uh, Whereas in the other three chapters, she's still, still saying with the child, do this, do that. In psychic, the whole chapter is addressed to the teacher. And that is the starting point for us because supposedly the other three parts, the vital, mental, physical, to some extent are developed. And yet, personally, whenever I read those chapters and I've read them hundreds of times, uh, I, I still am not there. I mean, there are so many things still to be done for my mind, for my vital and for my physical. So it is through influence that integral education happens. Mother and Shurabindo have not given specific, like I said, rigid formulae or system that do this, do this, do this, then it is integral education. So it is always the teacher, the adult. And even if you are mentoring adults, you are not teaching little children, and which we do in our work, uh, all of us, whoever works with uh, adults uh, at the Gnostic Center, we work with college students and with professionals also. We always apply the principles of integral education uh, in how to deal with, you know, how to overcome anger or how to develop self-confidence or how to deal with relationships. It's the same principles that are applied. Yes, uh, it's interesting that Abhinav uh, Dvivedi is writing the same way in the Gita, Sri Krishna and Arjun where uh, have a relationship of friends, not so much as teacher and student. Krishna does not impose himself as authority or superior person. 
though he is the divine incarnation, it seems in our educational system, the relation between the teacher and, and taught must be changed to friends, facilitate uh, a core discover, etc. And I think you are doing this quite well in the Gnostic Center. We call ourselves, we all called ourselves facilitators. We didn't claim anything more than that. We are core learners. We are core travelers. Yes. Uh, and uh, in this sense, we discover knowledge again and you. And if it is not happening, then then nothing much is happening in the format of this transition to the spiritual age. Because to re reveal some mental formula or dogma, we don't need any more teacher for that. We have a Google there, which will give us all the information, much better than any teacher can do. Yeah. So we need an example. We need a living experience. And so thank you for this. Yes, and there is another question. So Abhinav is answered already, I think, by Anuradha. But uh, Balasundari is asking, very happy to listen to the explanations of subjective age in education system by Jayanti and Mir from Mirambika and Anuradha from Gnostic Center. We who were educated in a Sri the Center of Education, International Center of Education, and that means in the ashram, are often questioned. How is it possible to link focus on career as well as inner realization simultaneously? Would you please cover this also? How is that even possible to connect these two? Career outside, which is still living in that industrial mindset, and... Um, new elements of uh, integral education. Are students who are kind of graduating from the ashram school are more efficient in the modern environment or less? Or what is happening there in that field? I is there some like advantage? Mm -hmm. I would not like to generalize because uh, in my view, like I said, we are still not there. What the mother's vision is of integral education, uh, and I would say free progress is still further than that. Uh, and there is a long way to go. But I personally know of examples, Amita, for example, the chairperson of the Gnostic Center being one such, who is heading a very successful business uh, and heading the Gnostic Center. And uh, integrating the two and uh, the career I mean there are many levels to it one is has the career been chosen based on an inner choice a deeper a calling which says that this is your vocation and therefore do it or has it been chosen for other concerns which may be very relevant you know one needs to earn money and even if one wants to do something else but that is not as lucrative and one's circumstances are such that one has to support oneself and others. And so money is also very important. And then how does one see those circumstances as being something given by the divine for one's own progress? And does one feel a victim of circumstances or does one feel that this is my choice and this is the field given to me to grow as a person? Now, the moment you make that shift, there is no division between inner growth and whatever you're doing on the outside. I mean, in a in very brief, that is the answer which comes to me. Yes, yeah, yeah, thank you. So there are more questions here. Is there anything you can say about the educational program developed in Auroville called awareness in the body or any other of educational experiences in Auroville? Uh, one thing about the, for example, awareness through the body and all, um, like I said, and Anuradha too said, that all these centers are aspiring centers. So as as the, the people who are involved in it grow within, they express it in many ways. And as they take in, you know, the, the community grows with them and activities are evolved 
from their own experiences and what worked for them and what they perceive would work for the rest of uh, the, the community which is coming in contact with that particular individual. So same with this. Now, any activity can be used to um, contribute to inner growth. It's how we look at that activity and how we bring about perfection in that activity. We may say awareness through the body, I've done it and therefore, have I grown any further? Then I'll have to ask myself questions. How have I, have I used um, what I've learned through awareness through the body? Do I understand the concept? Am I practicing as I walk? Am I aware of the, the, the various functions of the body? Am I aware of something inside through my body? So it all depends on what one is looking for from these activities, how one uses them in one's life. And these are not uh, standalone activities. They come with uh, one's aspiration and the rest of the things that we do. It's so nice that you mentioned this. Uh, thank you for this. Because we take awareness in the body uh, practice as if it is the final answer to all integral education. It's only a one part which has to be developed in the integral development of personality, which is absolutely necessary. This awareness in the body has to be developed, but it's a rather a technology of consciousness. It's like speech faculty or thought process. You can have to develop them or um, how to operate within the vital realm and with feelings, emotions, how to be master of one's own feelings, emotions, so and deal with anxieties and so on. So that is a skillful development, but it is not really the, the whole picture. There is many more, as you rightly said, aspiration is, should be part of it, sincerity, all the development of the inner qualities. And if they don't come, together with this uh, development of the awareness in the body, then one is becoming a very good robot, <laughs> moving very efficiently, which is already good achievement. So I am glad that you mentioned this because I had the, always this thought and never could really express it. And now you, I heard it first time. So then there is more, uh, there are more questions. As an educator, interested in implement, implementing integral education where which persons are best to connect with to develop integral education in USA, Canada, in America? I don't know. I mean, La Grasse is there in USA. So it is right there. You can connect with La Grasse. Right. Yeah, please come to us and we will find whatever you are looking for because we are in contact with many people in US. It would be easier. And also there is a big project which is called Cyan, Shirobindo Integral Education Network, Educational Network, which is... Um, uh, important to to tap into. We have also our, we just uh, spoke about several different uh, networks, which are connecting now to the bigger network of Shirobindo studies. Mm -hmm. There, from there, you can, we don't need, you don't need to be in uh, India to learn from La Grasse or from uh, uh, from the Gnostic Center or from Mirambika or from Oroville. It's all online, all the everything, all the teachings are available. You can connect with people and then you can visit them. I guess this is the answer. Uh, there is uh, Dawn's question from Dawn Salman. I would ask smiling, how is it possible not to connect in a development with career? <laughs> Dan Siegel uh, has inspired teachers reaching thousands of students around the world to remember throughout the day to connect with the center of consciousness as an essential uh, foundation for their studies. Uh, this to me is one of the great signs of movement towards uh, true subjectivism. Constantly remember your inner being and consecrate everything what you do. 
uh, remember and offer, as it were. So what would you say on this, smilingly? I think Don is commenting. I don't think it's a question. And I agree with him what he's saying, because uh, the, the very notion of int integrality is not to create this division between the inner life and the outer life, business and spirituality and those kind of things. So if we, the moment we create that division, it's a limitation of our understanding and our ability to uh, hold everything together in our being. So yes, uh, these days there are a lot of people who may not be so-called integral, who may not ever have heard of Sri and Mother. But as these ideas are, you know, like I said, the time spirit is there and people are resonating and they are also discovering these ideas themselves. So there is a kind of a, a synchronicity and a harmony that is that we are able to see. And we can get that help from anywhere. That is, that is a freedom also that uh, is provided by Sri Aurobindo's mother. It is the aim and the spirit that is important. The methods, each person has to find their own method and they can look at anything that helps them. Mm -hmm. Jayanti, you want to say? No, no I'm fine. Yeah. Yes, uh, there is, um, uh, um, Abhinav is, uh, uh, Vivedi is anticipating this next development in, uh, on Korea. I think the whole notion of Korea uh, parameters by which Korea is currently defined has to go through a significant change. And I totally agree. It has to fit your svabhava, as it were. You have to find yourself in action. Action has to be educational for you. Otherwise, it is losing its meaning, inner meaning. It, it Maybe you may earn some money and then use that time, free time for finding yourself. But it's much better to fit these two into one. So thank you, uh, Abhinav, for this uh, question. And that is the ideal of karma yoga, which was uh, pronounced by the mother for Aurobil. Uh, that Aurobil is for those who want to follow karma yoga. That was her, one of the last messages. So to, to take work and do it as yoga. That means every activity has to become educational. And most probably here is the key to this adult education. It doesn't have to be in the school. It doesn't have to be in some kind of session. You can do it at throughout, through the day, uh, in wherever you are, at home, at work, with in relation with people. We are constantly learning. We are constantly open to the discovery of our innermost self. So thank you very much uh, for this beautiful um, uh, seminar, webinar together. I'm very happy to reconnect with you and for this very meaningful uh, description of what, uh, how we are to change. We will post it on our website so you can come back to it and re-listen to it. And maybe even we transcribe it and leave it in that format. Oh, unless Anuradha has already a transcription so she could <laughs> share with us. <laughs> Lovely. Thank you very much. And thank you. Thank Namaste. you. Thank you both very much. Namaste. Thank you. Yeah.